Okay, so part two. I may take a few sips of San Pellegrino here, but anyway, um... So what I end up doing, after I set up all these different partitions, is I work to try to get <coughs> equal functionality in all of them, <coughs> or as much functionality as I can, and sometimes, you know, <coughs> uh, you know, I'll write these things down that I that I do because, you know, I might forget to implement something in another one, or I might make a really cool discovery towards the end when I'm configuring my last partition. <clears throat> so it ends up after a while I get like these checklists. I'm also going to apply these checklists uh, uh, to Windows, and some of, the, some of them are going to seem like pretty basic or, you know, like what the heck, but in some, some cases, you do an install of the distribution of the operating system, it doesn't just work. Um, the first on my list, of course, was I was just I, I was doing a test for each partition after updating my Grub and Fedora just to make sure everything booted. But that's no big deal. The next criteria I had was: does it boot? Does it just boot straight in and give you a graphical user interface to start with? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discuss, discuss a few experiences that I've had, and throw it also in with with the recent experience I had with Slackware 1337, uh, what the good, what the bad quality is, and what the good, what the redeeming quality is for, for Slackware 1337. In this case, in my opinion, as a desktop user, and obviously the guy that makes Slackware is not just thinking of only servers or only desktops when he makes it. So, what I'm going to discuss right now um, really should, in my opinion, should be an install option. Now, um, so what is, it, what is it? When you boot into Slackware, um, unless you've changed the um, etc. init tab file to read from 3 to 4, it won't present KDM or GDM or any graphical, it, it, won't, boot, it won't boot into run level 4, a graphical run level. It, by default, Slackware boots into the command line. That's a very easy recovery. It's very easy to recover this. For one, and that's that's the upside for the desktop user. The desktop user has to do little research for for Slackware, have a little bit of patience. But if you get too many of these things to add up, it, it ends up that all the things in in total kind of ruins the desktop experience. Nonetheless, if you know the user does a little bit of research, they'll find out. Actually, when they do the install, it'll ask you if you want to have. If you did install an X window or a window manager, um, it will ask you which one do you want to start automatically. So, at least when you're done with that in Slackware, if you reboot, you go in there and you type start X, whatever one you picked, that's the one that'll start automatically. You don't have to do start KDE or whatever the command is to start X, F, C, E, or, or GNOME. It's actually start X and it comes up. But what I wanted was it just a, you boot in there and you are greeted by KDM or GDM. And you don't have to do the start X thing because that's an extra step. It slows you down a little bit, a little bit of an inefficiency. Again, all these things add up. It's just another reason not to use it. Well, the way to take care of that is to change etc. init tab to to three, and you can you can do it fairly easy. And Slackware doesn't disallow the root user from logging into KDE like Mandriva does, so you can easily log in as root, click on my computer, browse up to etc. Change the init tab from three to four, and and you're done. Pretty good compromise, I think, but from a desktop perspective, 
you'd rather just have it always boot into um, into X automatically. And I, that's another thing I, that I really should say is that you know as time goes on, there's going to be less and less of a reason to have, um, especially in the on an X86 port, to have um, it not present X by default. Yeah. <laughs> Even you know, in this I keep a lot of old machinery around. In this office, we might have one 386 sitting around, and I doubt that if I installed software 1337 and tried to use X on it, that it would be so slow it'd be unusable. I, I really doubt that. Um, <coughs> so anyway, that's my suggestion. Um, if uh, pretty much during the install, what they should, what um, the guy that makes Lockware, um, what he should do is present just one more option to the user and say, hey, do you want to have X start automatically when you come in? Yes, we've ch we've checked. If if they pick a, a default window manager, then then ask them now. And then change that init tab for them so the first time they boot in it works that way. That that choice really should be an install choice. Um, it's probably the best best compromise. And rather than see, I, I'm in a luxurious situation. I could just reboot and go into the partition. I could browse the web, the Google easily, and do a search result, find it, and reboot back into Slackware and change the three to the four, or maybe even do it from the other partition I'm in. But um, a desktop user that only has is a command shell and doesn't know to type start x may have to who knows he's got to find another way to get to a computer he's got to go to the library wait for <laughs> wait in line until he gets his 10 minutes you know whatever <laughs> look it up hope he finds the right answer and not a false positive and come back and and, and, and do it and you know, and at that point, do they really know? Does a brand new user really know how to edit a text file? You know, maybe not, right? So the instructions might say, use VI. Oh, what a nightmare. So, as I'm just saying, make that an install option to make life a lot easier for a lot of people. Keep more people in the Linux camp. And that, that's the whole idea of what I'm doing here. Okay. So getting back to Ubuntu, um, now I'm going to say, you know, one of my general impressions of Ubuntu, Ubuntu is probably, right now, in my opinion, it is the the, the flagship Linux distribution. It's, it's, it has probably the most applications available to end users. The most usability, the most support. Um, it's got beautiful, up, beautifully easy upgrades and updates. Um, I've I've upgraded three to four machines from seven to four to eleven to four with without a problem. To me, that is just it gets the the greatest for package management. The package management area. Ubuntu sets the standard in operating systems, in my opinion, of, out of out of all of them. It includes Windows, includes Macs, everything. Uh, now, as far as apps that are ported to it, <clears throat> it doesn't set the standard. Um, but of the apps that are ported to it, it, it does. <clears throat> I think it's uh, my criticisms of Ubuntu right now, and. Um, and people really ought not to to confuse this with being afraid of change. If I was afraid of change, I I used DOS <laughs> before. If I was afraid of change, I wouldn't be complaining about a command line. Um, I just know I have enough of a mind to know what what's going to work better for some people and what isn't. And I know that <clears throat> without a doubt in my mind that this. Uh, this Unity window 
is, is just a real step down where you got all these icons that are on the left and then if your icon for an app you want to use isn't there, well tough luck um, on mine I had so many apps that it would that literally I'd scroll up and down with the mouse and it would just keep going I, the, the left side of my computer screen couldn't display them all um, I'd just rather be able to find it in a logical location rather than having icons that are more or less, you know, or various levels of, of, of being descript on the left hand side uh, that I may or may not remember that what it's used for, such as say caffeine, there's a little cocoa bean, doesn't really tell me it's a media player. Um, you, know, you can kind of get lost. How do you add an icon if you installed an app and it, it doesn't integrate with this, up, you know, with this uh, new system? Well, Guess what? You're kind of in trouble, or you have to look it up, or okay, <clears throat> or you have a if you have a scroll bar that you can't see, and so you kind of gotta find it, you know. And I even saw that, you know, right now I was using uh, Windows uh, Internet Explorer nine earlier today, and that scroll bar got shrunken down so much, I I I really almost couldn't find it to go up and down on the page, at least easily in an efficient manner. You want things to be big enough and sized enough to be in an easy and efficient manner. Not everything has to be reinvented and not everything has to be new. Some things that have been working very well for a long time should stay the way they are. And the best example of that kind of um, belief in old, te old technology um, comes right into play when, we're talk when you talk about food. You know, no one needs to reinvent spaghetti or, you know, a steak or some kind of <laughs> gourmet dinner. I mean, the, the way that food is cooked has been studied and perfected over a long, long time. And, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, this is not adding that little visible scroll bar at the right that you have to wobble your mouse around and guess where it's at is not a step forward. It's not a additional perfection. It doesn't do much at all for the desktop user. Uh, the next mistake I think they made, um, although it only really affects multi-boot users like myself, really, beyond just having Windows, which really is about 95% of everybody out there, is um, the use of Grub2. Anybody that's using <coughs> uh, more than if you're using more than two operating systems on your machine, chances are great you probably don't want to use Grub2. Uh, you want to use Grub1. And you know what? Back in the days when there was only just Windows and for for God for about, probably about ten last ten years now, I mean, even when just was Lilo um, that Slackware still uses, by the way, um, it, it was able to handle easily. Um, Grub One was able to easily handle just two menu items, um, and so why why are they use, why would anybody want to use Grub Two anyway? I mean, the more advanced user doesn't want a half satisfactory solution to automatically be spit out for them, and the new user doesn't really have any special needs. It requires this depth of automatic detection that Grub2 tries to do. So I, again, I don't see any reason to use it. I don't think it's a good, good idea. Uh, pretty much in any case, um, I remember when I used uh, Red Hat Seven that when after I switched the installer from the computer on, there there was a graphical presentation there for me to choose which operating system I want when I wanted to go into. I've yet to see any actual benefit. I've only seen problems for me in my situation in that um, Grub2 will erase what I already have in place and I gotta hope I picked a partition to control my booting from that's not gonna get paved over by Grub2 or I'm gonna be whipping out the Nopix disks and trying to, to CH root into the system which is just ridiculous. Um, 
So that's my opinion of, of Ubuntu. It's got the most Linux apps out there. Um, it's on target for that. Um, I think that moving away from GNOME was a bad move, but I think that really if it was going to be the best distribution out there, it should have picked, actually, uh, to start with, it should have picked KDE 3 and stuck with that. And, and actually not gone with the new KDE packages and kept developing KDE 3 um, all the way to this day and it would be in a better position I think to use because KDE has shown me the most usability and some in the basic set out of it I'm not talking about um, whether you know the little you know KDisk free version that comes with KDE 4 is better or worse than the one that shipped with KDE 3 or whether you know whatever you know the additional apps are all I'm talking about are the icons um, the options you had when you wrote right clicked on the when you right click on the desktop and the options that you have for changing permissions when you right click on a folder that has contents and the, you know the ability to put icons on the desktop and that's the main thing. The secondary thing is Dolphin is just ugly. I mean, it just is ugly. Um, no, you know, the Gnome environment doesn't really look that much better to me either. It's just a little too brownish, I, you know, and, and, and <laughs> the minimizing, you know, the window minimizing just on the left-hand side just feels a little strange. Of course, I'm obviously, you know, I use Windows a lot too. Okay, so I'm going to go on to the next one, and that's Linux Mint. And I'm going to go into a little more detail on, on the installer. And this is Linux Mint 11. <coughs> I'm going to take a sip here before my mouth dries out. Now, I first tried out Linux Mint, I think it was version 8 or 9 as far as I know. And my first impression was is that this is just Ubuntu. It's just Ubuntu. And instead of having the menu bar items on the top, they kind of you know, get it on the bottom and things seem to be easier to find, but you know what? With, uh, app, with Ubuntu, it isn't really that hard to find the stuff on the top. And, you know, it looks a little bit different and Okay, I didn't see any real reason to use it beyond Ubuntu because in the back of my mind I thought, well, these guys are using the Ubuntu repositories, and if they don't, they, they've got they have to stay in sync with what Ubuntu's doing in the background. If they miss anything, then well, with these little tweaks that they have, if one of these updates aren't compatible, then you know something's gonna there's gonna have some betrot there. I still kind of feel that way. Um, I don't necessarily think that there's no reason to use Linux Mint. I, you know, I found that when I went into it, I was there's one thing that I was very impressed by Linux Mint that gets the highest marks, and that a bunch of really should do, and really should not back down from this. And that Slackware is done in part, and that is to have Java and Flash come installed with the system fresh out of the box if you install everything, and. Slackware does. Slackware comes with uh, Java. It's from the release of 1337. I think it's only one or two updates behind, but it doesn't come with Flash. Linux Mint out of the box comes with Flash and Java, which I think is very good for the desktop user. Um, Linux Mint is geared, geared towards the desktop user. I looked in the command line to see whether Linux Mint had the ATI drivers uh, also with it natively during during the install. It just comes with it. Um, no, it didn't, <coughs> as far as I know. But and so I didn't see I didn't see any evidence that the that Wobbly Windows were activated at that point or CompUse. I don't know with the card that I have here. It definitely is an ATI card. It's a Radeon. It's a Radeon card. I think I, I had the OSS Radeon driver in there, 
I didn't tinker around uh, too much yet with uh, Linux Mint to get um, you know CompUs to work, but um, you know so far I mean, at least with putting those two very basic and important things in there, I thought that was was great. I didn't test out WebGL in Firefox 4. There would also be a very, a very big benefit if, if Linux Mint also shipped with uh, WebGL turned on and, and tweaked when it shipped. Um, I did find that when I tried to use Mint that everything was in a logical place and had a good name. Everything was named very well. And the look it had a really sharp look to it, you know. And so I was really thinking to myself that if Mint can provide a stable underground or uh, underbelly for developers to be able to know that if they port their app over to this Mint, that two, three, four releases from now it's still going to be able to run without any problems, or them having to maintain it or support issues, then you know it 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 also it's a candidate platform port their apps over to. So, although I was a bit disappointed that I didn't see them have a, a stronger attitude to just, by default, put the proprietary drivers in there, or at least ask the user if they wanted to, I thought that putting Java and Flash in there was very positive. Now, the, the next thing I want to go into is, is a very fine distinction, and I think you know, on the Linux Mint's installer, I think it misses the mark on one thing. And I guess I just have to tell you what the situation was. So on my system I have obviously I have at least um, you know 13 partitions here. Actually I do. I have 13 partitions. SDA 13 is a swap partition and I have my Windows 7 install is taking up three and then the fourth partition is sliced to bits into nine parts I think with um, uh, you know with a bunch of different Linux installations available to it and um, over the course of the the history of this this computer <clears throat> at one point I was I had the desire to put one of the BSDs on uh, probably free BSD and I wanted to put it on here but if I was going to do that I would have either had to give up any other installations of Linux because it, BSD has to rest on a primary partition, not a logical partition. At least last time I checked, and that was about almost a year ago. Um, I ended up, at the end of the day, I ended up having an empty partition. At one point I had two Ubuntu Linux installations and I eventually um, formatted that drive, that partition, and, and left it open and kind of forgot about it. So I was, you know, going back and doing these installs, and I had, by that, by the time I got to Linux Mint, I had already installed um, the new Fedora, I believe, and the new Mandarin 1002, Fedora 15 was, was the other one, and um, I went to, I, I stuck the disk in from the Linux Mint download. I didn't try an in-place upgrade. Um, I probably should have. But because I wanted to go and start using 64-bit Linux Mint rather than 32 and make that jump, um, the in-place upgrade wouldn't accomplish what I wanted to do. So you know, I took all my files off there, stored it on one of these um, on my little terabyte iOmega portable drive there, and um, started the install from fresh, or at least planned to. And at that time, Linux Mint was resting on HDA8, I believe. And um, the partition that was open at the time was HDA or SDA12. Um, one of the many partitions in the one logical part you know, partition that I have on my hard disk where all the Linux installations are resting right now. So I booted it up and it, everything seemed smooth and clean up to a certain point and then it asked me, then it got to the point, well, 
to pretty much make a choice, you know, where do you want to put this Linux Mint? And it presented itself with three choices. One was, hi, I could see you have multiple operating systems on your system. What do you want to do? This, if you select this, we'll just put Linux Mint next to all the other ones. Well, I have a, <laughs> I have a very fragile situation <clears throat> in that I have SD, uh, sorry, HDA, no, sorry, SDA 1, 2, and 3 being taken up by Windows, and SDA 4 is the container of a logical partition for SDAs 5 through 13. And in some circumstances, the numbering will change dra dramatically if you if you uh, uh, turn one of the um, primary partitions into a logical partition, like a second one, or you move something and you insert a partition on t in front of another one, or you know things of that nature. So I, you know, I looked at that and I saw that option along with the other one, just erase the disk. And the third option was called something else. So I picked option number one because it detected I had other operating systems. And I thought if I pick number one and click next, it would ask me, well, where do you want to put this thing? It didn't ask. It just started copying the files down, and I was worried at that point. And I pulled the plug. Now that didn't cause a problem by pulling the plug. You know everything was okay. It ended up it was it ended up creating the um, uh, turning the empty partition I had, which was HDA eleven, into two two parts. One part was about a gigabyte of swap space, which I actually needed. I, I had lost my swap space at, at, at one point and never really took action to get it back in any of my systems. And uh, it started copying files into the NMP partition and just automatically formatted it with ext4. I booted back in after just taking a look to see if it did any damage and went to Ubuntu and I went to gparted and I looked and I saw that that partition had been split into two parts. One was swap, one was ext4 and about 500 megabytes had been copied in the short while that I let it run. And so I thought, okay, well, no, no permanent damage was done. I'll, I'll give it another shot. Okay, maybe I should pick the something else option when I boot in. So I stuck the CD, back, the DVD back in, and rebooted. And uh, this time I picked something else. And what something else presented to me was the option to delete, to format SDA two which I should back up. On my on this particular system that, that shipped from HP, uh, Windows is actually resting on two partitions. One partition, one primary partition is has really been wasted. It, it's primarily, all it is is a bootloader to get the get Windows to load up out of SDA2. So you know my grub my grub um, entry points to the first partition, and then it immediately jumps from the first partition to the second primary partition and boots Windows, where Windows is actually resting on the second part partition. And then you know the la and then the third partition has a factory recovery kind of option, which I'm wondering if it will actually work, because I don't know if it's looking for 150 gigabytes to take up it, take up the recovery space from, or if it's just looking for the for SDA1, whatever that is, in Windows E's. <coughs> but I digress. Um, so I, I had that option, and then the other option was to go to the space that I uh, SDA 11, the, the, where the partial install had already started. And meanwhile, I couldn't see the partition that had Linux Mint 9 that, sitting on it that was running in the riser file system. And I thought, well, maybe maybe they've taken riser out of it and they, they just can't, maybe the installer can't handle it. I thought. I was wrong, but I, I thought maybe that was it. You know, so I rebooted and back to Ubuntu and I formatted that Linux Mint partition 
with um, EXT4. I thought, well, certainly now it's going to detect the, the old Linux Mint partition. I'll be able to install where I wanted to. Because, you know, the empty space was actually bigger than the Linux Mint partition, and I've always had in the back of my mind of reinstalling a newer, uh, or having, moving my, somehow moving my Ubuntu up to that one where I had more space. But, you know, I have 20 gigabytes on each one of these installs. It's still been plenty, especially with the, these USB devices. But I digress. So I boot back in, tried to get there. Nope, same thing's presented itself. Uh, the second Windows partition was available to format and destroy, and the one that was empty um, was also available, but that was it. And so finally I just gave up and put Linux Mint on my second biggest partition of, on my hard disk right now. I would rather have my Ubuntu install over there, but that's just the way it is. I, I may be able to resize these partitions anyway and get them the way I want, but um, and, oh, oh, also, another point. So after I picked something else and I said, oh, and I said, well, okay, well, I'll just format this empty partition again because it had like 500 megabytes of a partial install on there. Um, it asked me what file system I wanted to, to, to format it with, and Riser was one of the choices, so I went with that. I, I prefer Riser. Um, I don't think that the man did was was good. I've already explained this, but I do. I've had some very good experiences using Riser. I've had, I've had the ability to recover files I thought was never possible to get back with, with the Riser file system tools. So I favor it. I've hardly ever had a situation. In fact, I've never had a situation where I wasn't able to boot back into the system because of a file system check. I've never had to be in a situation where um, the operating system I booted into was read-only because of a file system issue, never ever. Um, so I'll st I'm going to stick with what works well, and that works well. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm just out for end use, end use usability, I'm not here for, pro for political correctness, although you know I have stuck my neck out and I've, I've said that I don't care who you are, what you do with your life, whether you're straight, you're gay, you're religious, you're whatever, you know, you're, as far as I'm concerned, you're a person and you deserve to use Linux and no one needs to bother you about it. If you have said that, I've taken a little bit of flack for it. No big deal. Um, but in most circumstances, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic. Okay. But I digress. Okay, so that that's my thing about men. And, and I thought about it, well, is Mint trying to oversimplify something for the user here, or is it just the installer is lacking some kind of capabilities? I don't know. Now, when I went to the partitioner, I will say this: the one thing I absolutely God, just just looking at it just bugged me. I really shouldn't care. After all, it works. Um, I can't stand the way that that Ubuntu and that Linux Mint partitioner. Present, presents itself like a multicolored, strangely colored hot dog, <laughs> you know, at the top, but, you know, no big whoop. Um, so getting into Mint, um, booted in, went on the internet, and didn't have to do anything. I was able to watch YouTube, and I moved on from that. So, so even though I thought that there's a serious issue with uh, the installer if you're on if you're if you're multi-booting, you you got to be careful with Linux Mint, and your choices will be limited. So you got to work around those limitations to get it actually on your system. But overall, once it's installed, I think it's it, it it's a better looking Ubuntu, but with um, the you know some risk involved. 